Hey everybody, welcome to Keyword Crypto. This is Michael, and I have a special guest, Mr. G, who's friends with Oops from Banana, who I interviewed last week. And I wanted to talk to Mr. G about introducing Banano into his classroom. So welcome, Mr. G. Awesome. Thank you very much. I'm so glad to be on here and sort of given a chance to share my story a little bit. So I guess before we begin, maybe I can give myself a little bit of background about who I am and sort of how this banana in the classroom came to be, if that's cool with you. Yeah, perfect. Perfect. Awesome. So I am a uh, third year teacher in Canada. I teach in elementary grade, so grade four or five. So the kids are about nine to 10 years old. And uh, really what happened was with Banana in the Classroom, I was at the end of my rope as a teacher. And I mean, all of the teachers that are listening here, I know you've been in that position before where, you know, you've tried everything and just nothing is working. And I've got this class of kids that are, you know, starving for some kind of order and discipline, but asking for it in all the wrong ways and acting out in all the wrong ways. And, you know, really, I was, I don't know if uh, you guys have listened before, but Oops sort of told the story of how I was having these, almost what I could only describe as a panic attack. I mean, I've never actually had one, but it would be the only way I could describe what was happening before I was going into the school and just having to take time, you know, actually bring my heart rate down before I would even go in and teach in the morning. So I was sort of in a a very low place uh, at this point, and then... Oops, and I had this conversation about what were, what were some of the things we really enjoyed about our our education? What were some of the things we maybe were missing? And one of the things we came back to was this idea of sort of a, a tokenized economy. You know, kids were given points or kids were given like classroom dollars that were then able to be redeemed later on for certain things. And, you know, we, we thought, you know, what were some of the flaws though with that? Oh, kids could steal that or they could lose it or things could get lost or misplaced or duplicated. And what solved that problem is Banana in the Classroom. It was sort of our 21st century solution or our 21st century tokenizing of something that's been done time and time again. And, you know, in my Bachelor of Education degree, I've read multiple studies about sort of these tokenized incentive programs and the massive success they do have on student behavior and being able to improve classroom management. So it was really cool to be able to find something that brings us into the 21st century that's also instant feeless has the really cool monkeys the kids love and the QR codes are another really great thing. I walk up and down the aisle with my phone and I can just scan the QR code like that to send their points or their bands instantly to them. So that's sort of the little elevator pitch of what's going on here. That's great. And the fact that it's instant and feeless, more or less instant and feeless, um, they can see that reward right away. Well, and that's the, that's the sort of the best part. And I mean, you've got to meet the kids where they're at and they are the generation of instant gratification. They want the reward and they want it now. So they do get to see those bands go right away into their account. But then we also build in that delayed, that delayed piece where now you're working towards a goal at the end of the week or, you know, not even potentially the end of the week. It could be even the end of the month, depending on how the class is doing, how they're earning the bands. And uh, we can get in a little bit more to how sort of the the financial literacy piece fits in and what some of the regulations around the store are too, if you want to get into some of the nitty yeah, gritty yeah. a bit there when we get into how things get, uh, yeah, get jump set up it. as well. Yeah, just jump right into it. So, uh, so really sort of we're going to go through the steps of how it gets started. As I basically went to Oops, he was able to – find somebody who could code a some way that we could generate a all safe for work seed. So all of the wallets that would be generated, all the monkeys or the crypto monkeys that would be generated within this wallet are all, you know, there's no, no cigars, nothing that would be, you know, anything that you couldn't have posted in the classroom. So, so that's so sort of step really, number one. So really fast, if you're not, if you're unfamiliar with Banano, there's the ability to create your own little avatar you plug in your banana address and it and it creates a one of a kind uh, you know monkey avatar and some of them are and some of them have cigars and and cigarettes and so that's what he means when he says uh 
school friendly or like kid friendly because yeah that would be kind of weird if i was a parent and i'm like my kid's avatar tar is a monkey smoking a cigar um <laughs> so yeah that, right, you don't exactly right. want to see that you know the, the monkey with the patrick pants on sure they're they're all for that so uh, basically you would generate then one teacher wallet and then within that wallet because Calium is an amazing app you can have up to now, I know just for the the school safe ones, they guarantee you can generate up to 30 different wallets for all of your students. So each student then gets an individual wallet that's all managed within the teacher's wallet, which is great. So the bands are all staying sort of within one closed ecosystem at this point. Obviously, we're looking at a way that we could expand it and give the kids even more autonomy at some point with this. We're just not quite at that point yet. But Sure, that's sure. neither here nor there with the uh, the process of getting set up. Just something we've got up our sleeves that Upas and I are working on that may be coming down the pipeline. But uh, so once each kid has generated the wallet, they then get they get the monkey avatar and a QR code that is unique to their wallet. So I print those both out, cut them out, laminate them for the kids. They absolutely love the fact that it's the monkey. It's a super engaging looking character. And then the QR code is sort of the the real kicker that they they love the fact that I can say, all right, guys, QR codes up or, you know, first first five kids sitting down, ready to go, QR code out, get 500 bands. And then wow. I'm able to just go through and with the Calium app. You're just Mr. Money Bags, scan, aren't you? <laughs> the, the way it works is uh, what we actually did was align the, the numbers that we use to match the curriculum that we're teaching. So at that grade level, students are working with numbers up to 9,999. Okay. So we give them bands that would help them represent sort of real world numbers that they would see in working up to that 9,999 number. So we're trying to That's make great. that math connection for them as well. So That's great. And again, we keep in mind it's a closed system. So those bands really never actually leave the teacher wallet. Yeah. They're just sort of spread out within a sub wallet in there. So that's sort of the, that's the nice part of keeping it as a closed system. Um, so then basically once the students have those bands, they see the updated bands every day. And then what I've done is I've told the kids the, su- the total supply that I have if they reach half of it. So half of the bands have been distributed to the class. Then they get to open store. And the store sort of just has different items. It did uh, in previous years when we were allowed to bring in food and share food with the kids. You know, pre-COVID, there was things like, pizza donuts uh different things like that there was also time where the kids were able to book like free time on the chromebook to do different things like uh scratch coding or tinkercad or two of the sort of more educational programs i have the students working on so i'm not sure if anybody's familiar with uh what those are but scratch is yeah, basically I've a used, drag and I've drop puzzle scratch. piece i've uh, built a video game with that it. teaches kids how to code in a fun very simple way go ahead and then tinkercad is sort of a 3d a uh, design rendering ah, program that Lost again him. just is sort of scaled Fairmer. back to a kid friendly way. So these were sort of options that the kids were then hey, able to spend you, their uh, bands on. Hold on, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, because you you got kicked off for a second. Um, oh. So let's go back to Scratch because I've used yeah. Scratch before. I built the video game and it's a lot of fun. So that's where you get cut off. Yeah, so absolutely. So Scratch is just that's a sort of an example of an option that the kids would be able to spend some some of their bands on for their, their Chromebook time is something that they could buy. And that would just be an example of something they would be working on as they may be working on creating some kind of small video game or something like that. And this is just a way that they can earn time towards that. So it's just something productive that they're doing with those. Uh, recently, I've moved towards some more renewable or sort of non-consumable things. So I've bought an you know, I've got a mini air hockey game that the kids can play. I've got ping pong. I've got mini basketball. Um, there's really something for pretty much everybody. I've got Lego. I've got building blocks. I've got plasticine and all types of hands-on activities and things like that that are all sort of incentivizing the kids to earn these bands, save these bands, and then spend them when it comes to be store time. Nice. Nice. And so what what kind of reaction have you gotten from the from the kids since you introduced ban or or since you introduced the that kind of monetary like teaching system i guess it's uh it's really been night and day like i like i said with oops i mean i was really on 
at the bottom of where I really thought I could go. You know, there was there was nowhere else to go but up at that point, and we did really make our way back up. The kids absolutely love it. I mean, there'll be points now where they're looking at each other to, hey, like, come on, get in line and you know, come on, like, sit down quietly. Like, we want to earn these, we want to earn these bands so that store can open. Like, we're really so they're now starting to take on some of that leadership or some of that uh and some of that responsibility onto themselves as well to monitor not only their behavior but their classmates so it was really a complete 180 from where we were like it's it let me teach again i didn't have to focus on the classroom and you know the the issues that were happening and all the disruptions they really dialed back and and let the kids really focus on learning a bit more as well. And I think it introduced uh, financial literacy in a very fun but realistic way for them. Because a lot of times I think that, you know, younger kids don't necessarily get introduced to money. They don't understand necessarily the value of money. And I'm not going to – I think that bands is a nice way to start to introduce them to that and some of the concepts around, you know, saving and – even spending and then looking at, you know, one example that I'll, I'll bring from the, the store is that I believe like I have like pick five, uh, five just dance songs to do as a class is 700 bands, or you could pick two just dance songs for the class to do for, I think a hundred bands. So if you're looking at what's going to be the best value, you buy the smaller amount a few more times over and you get the better value versus, you know, always going for that bigger amount because it may look like the better deal. So it's just one of those small lessons that you can teach kids that are one of those things that potentially wasn't always taught when oops or myself was going through the education system. Well, I mean, the whole marshmallow test only came out what like the sixties or seventies. So, I mean, I don't think people even was, were aware that that's how kids instinctually thought was immediate rewards versus long term. So like teaching them that that's, that's a great idea to incorporate that kind of stuff. Um, for anybody who doesn't know what the marshmallow test was, is they were putting kids in rooms and saying, here's a marshmallow in front of them, and then saying, I'm going to go outside for 10, I'm, I'll be right back. If you can not eat that, I'll give you I'll give you a second marshmallow. And a lot of the kids would just eat it because they want that instant gratification. And so it's, it's, uh, it's good that you're, that that's, that, that you're incorporating ideas about how to teach, um, like long-term thinking versus short-term gratification. That's great. No, absolutely. It sort of brings it to that that just a little bit higher level cognitive functioning where you can delay that gratification because you know that you're working towards a different goal or another goal there. And I think it's uh, it's great too because then it also it allows the kids to collaborate as well. And I think that that time when they're just given – sort of that, that freedom those kids who choose to create with the Lego or those kids that choose to create with, with Scratch or even with uh, even with the plasticine, like they're collaborating with each other and they're having these conversations that normally I don't know that would naturally be facilitated if they weren't doing a preferred activity, but they're seeing now that, you know, oh, my, my classmates that maybe I wouldn't always choose to hang out with, but that chose to do this activity, we do have some things in common as well. So there's that whole social emotional piece that sort of that coming together as a classroom community and even like the band sort of tying that together as the community economy and, and sort of that notion as well. That's interesting because I, f- I feel like on playground recesses, it was always just kind of like, I, I, I remember like always wanted to do certain things, but sometimes get kind of getting sucked into things that I n- may not have wanted to do just because I wanted to hang out with certain people or, so it's interesting that that you're that the kids are actually going into realms. How does that? I mean, how does that work? Are are you are they are you like completely? I don't even know how I'm, I'm, what I'm trying to say here. Are you sidestepping uh, the emotional hangups of being a kid sometimes of wanting to be cool or hang out with certain people, and instead doing what they like and then forming new friendships with people that they wouldn't have normally done? Is that pretty? Is that consistent or is that? Is that the norm or is that kind of um, like a minority? So I'm, I'm fairly lucky in that this is the group that I'm with now. This is my second year with them, my second year with Banana in the classroom. So it's been able to evolve. And you definitely do see now the, the kids more reaching out based on their individual interests 
and less of, okay, well, what, what are my friends doing? And it's more of, well, what do I really want to spend my time doing? Like, I'm the one that have earned these points. I'm the, or that I've earned these bands. Pardon me. Yeah. Cause and, they're you know, paying they're, for it. <laughs> that's exactly. That's so they're like, crazy. I want to do this. Like it, it doesn't matter if, you know, my best friend wants to go and do say that my best friend wants to go and do Lego. I'm, I'm playing air hockey no matter what. That's what I'm spending my bands on. I worked hard all month to get them. That's what I'm going to do. And I think it's, it's great to see because then you have other kids that are of that same mindset. And maybe these two kids would have never thought that, hey, we could talk, we could have a conversation, we can, you know, potentially be friends. And not that I'm saying everybody has to be best friends, but it just helps create this idea of, you know, everybody has to get along because, you know, there are, there are people that enjoy things that you enjoy, but they may not enjoy everything. And yeah. it again, sort of teaches kids that, that valuable lesson that, you know, well, again, we may not all be best friends. We can all get along as well. And there's definitely, you know, there's more to people than the one or two things that maybe we see sometimes. And it's nice when the kids have the the freedom to sort of express themselves a little bit. And I think, again, that comes with the fact that this has now been the group, the same group that I've had for the second year. So they are more comfortable with each other. And I do also have the benefit of teaching at a smaller school. So these kids have been sort of cohorted together in some way, shape or form for the majority of their education up to this point. So the majority of, you know, almost five or six years with some combination of the same group of kids as well, gotcha. has created a nice sort of mixture of comfortability for them as well. And how many students do you have in your class? So right now we are at 21 students um, and we are, we're entirely virtual right now. So the, the transition to virtual has been tough with Banano in the classroom. It's not quite as easy to to get the enthusiasm it is in the classroom because, again, there's that whole social piece of when store day does come. So yeah. we're still sort of looking at ways that we can revamp it and bring it into the virtual classroom space. But prior to that, it was sort of one of the the highlights and one of the look forward to days for the students and Again, I think it takes into consideration just that idea of the sort of social emotional health of the students and, you know, not to make light of anything that's happened with the pandemic and with, you know, the students being out of the schools as much as they have been in the last year and a half, too. I think as a teacher moving forward, it, it's good to honor the need for that sort of social emotional growth for the students and to facilitate some of those, facilitate some of that time. And I think STORE does a great way of doing that. So, you know, on top of being this financial literacy tool, it's also, you know, helping foster the social emotional growth that maybe has been stunted in the last year and a half because of the pandemic and because of what we've sort of been facing as far as uh, lockdowns and virtual schooling goes as well. Yeah. I mean, I think that's hard. It's, it's anybody who says there's a right or wrong way. I don't think that anybody's coming at it from a sense of like, they want to harm anybody, but it's just, it's the whole thing of like give and take, like everything is every like there's no such thing as black and white. You gotta, you gotta try to figure out the best path and there's going to be pros and cons to every single choice we make with kids. No, with everything adults, is sort of a shade work. of gray and we've got to, yeah. we've got to look for what's going to be the best for, for everybody. And the, you know, I do, I do tip my hat back to my students and, you know, honestly, all of the students that are, you know, persevering through this and their adaptability and their flexibility and their really their their stick to itiveness and their ability to, you know, transition back and forth almost seamlessly. Like it does take a lot of a lot of hard work and a lot of adaptability and flexibility on the students end too. So I don't want to take away from any of what they're able to do as well. But uh Yeah, I just I, really, I mean I, I keep hearing about um, uh children's emotional health. And I just, I, you know, a lot of parents have died and I just can't imagine being a kid and then 10 years later realizing that they died because I went to school and got sick and then, but I didn't die from it and I passed along to my parents and they did. I mean, that happened a lot in a lot of inner city communities in, in LA and I can't imagine the long-term health. And so it's this whole thing of like, you really got to try to figure out what's best for everybody, not just the kids, not just the parents, and just try to find, like, got to come to some kind of grips. But, sorry, big detour. Let's get back to ba banana in the classroom. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So, um, um, Have you noticed any negative issues with inter introducing it? 
Um, there have been just like I, I think Oops has kind of mentioned it in like you know other kids offering to sell other kids pencils and creating sort of their own little micro economy within the the macro economy that I've created those those types of things and I've also potentially introduced like things like bounties so if you know somebody finds your QR code on the ground at the end of the day then that person has to pay you you know so many bands as a bounty because you know you didn't take the responsibility to clean up your work area properly so there I wouldn't say there's negative things it just, it does just bring out some of the competitive spirit in some of the kids it also brings out some of the uh, the more entrepreneurial side in kids too <laughs> that you know you get the little hustlers in the back of the room that, okay so you're selling pencils for 250 bands because what I'll do is I I do give the kids as many school supplies as I possibly can but at a certain point, I also want to instill responsibility. And, you know, school supplies don't grow on trees, especially when the majority of the supplies that I have in my classroom come out of my pocket. I pay for the majority of those. It's just the the unfortunate reality of the education system being underfunded is teachers everywhere are digging deep into their own pockets to make sure that their students have enough. So I do try to give them everything they could possibly need. But if they go up beyond, so say they're just constantly losing pencils. Well, I'll say, okay, at this point, you can normally I'll let them trade in. Say you have a little stub of a pencil left. You can trade me in that for a brand new pencil, no problem, because it shows me you've used it. But if you lose your pencil, now you're going to have to pay for one. So now you're going to have to pay with 100 of your bands. So instead of being able to spend those in store, you're now spending that on a pencil. And hopefully, it's going to help you be more responsible. And that's the only time that you have to spend that 100 bands. So now I've got kids in the back of the class being like, well, I'll tell you what, I'll sell you a pencil for 50 bands then. <laughs> but because I control all the transactions, obviously that doesn't happen. So that is just one of the things, though, that, you know, the kids have brought up that, well, how if you can do it, how come we can't? So something, again, moving forward that Oops and I are going to sort of look at is how can we create that micro economy as well with it? Yeah, because, I mean, would you do you need to worry about kids you know mysteriously losing their pencils to and some kid going oh well i'll sell you one i got one right here that i can sell you it's like hey wait a minute it, that, that that's my pencil <laughs> so or right, like somebody it's one of those things you know mysteriously finding my qr code that was right on my desk but now it's not there <laughs> and, now, and now they're getting a bounty that, for it has definitely happened before and I, that's why i had to like curtail it back to even like just the end of the day because like I had kids that would just they would spend the entire class sometimes just like hawkeyeing the floor waiting for somebody to drop their QR code and oh my god it they owe me points and it's like no they, they don't owe you bands. I, I've moved it till it's at the end of the day if the classroom is clean and uh, that sort of leads to another really cool uh, aspect of banana in the classroom sort of teaching responsibility as well and I know oops sort of touched on it last week as well but sort of the the involvement of the custodian and sort of the kids taking responsibility for the cleanliness of our learning environment. So I always, always, always try to impress all my class that, you know, the custodian is here to make sure that our environment is sanitized and clean. It's not her job to pick up our garbage and things like that. It's, it's our job to make sure that our classroom and our learning environment is neat and tidy. Nice. And so I've teamed up with the custodian who gives us a score out of 10 for the classroom and then a score of 10 for the hallway where the kids keep their boots and their coats and their stuff like that at the end of every day. And each of those out of the 10, so a possible 20 points, each one of those points then translates to one band that every kid in the class gets. So say we get a 16 out of 20, that's 16 bands then that every kid gets for that day. And so we do that five days a week and, you know, we've gone from getting, I'm not proud to say that we were down in the, you know, the threes and the twos at one point. <laughs> and it was, it was not nice. And it was, it was awful. It was a lot of me sweeping up the classroom at the end of the night because I felt bad for the custodian having to come in and clean that mess <laughs> to, you know, getting 10 out of 10 and, and even, you know, bonus points because, you know, something, all the shoes were put together in pairs on the top and just like little things that the kids have picked up on that they know the custodian appreciates that we do. And, you know, it makes her job easier and it also makes the kids take responsibility for the learning space again. So it's just another way that Banana in the classroom is sort of fostering that responsibility in the in the students as well. And also showing respect for somebody else's 
uh, hard work, you know, and understanding that that person's job isn't, like you said, isn't to clean up after them. It's just to sanitize and make sure it's safe for them. And that's a big difference. Um, what did you, when you went into it, did you feel, were you worried about anything in particular? Because you said, uh, when, you know, when you're getting your bachelor's that you've studied this, um, cause I, I, you know, I did some research and I've, I looked at pros and cons. Um, was there anything that you particularly were concerned about going into it that you were actively trying to avoid from happening? Um, I think sort of there was, there was two sort of things that were kind of a concern. Number one was just the, the fact that it is, it was unheard of, right? Like nobody, nobody in the education realm, at least in my sphere of influence, was talking about banana or even even cryptocurrencies for that matter. So to, to bring this idea in was completely, completely novel. And uh, what was really cool though, was it was, it was a hundred percent validated by one of our, uh, so in the, the board that I work for has these teachers that sort of are specialists in certain areas. So I had a behavior specialist teacher come in and observe my classroom. And, you know, she observed it prior to me implementing this, implementing banana in the classroom and came back afterwards and just said the difference was night and day. So it was really nice to have that validated that even though this was sort of a, a crazy unheard of virtual, uh, virtual currency system that I was working with the kids that it a hundred percent worked. So that was one of the concerns was just like, nobody had heard about this before. I didn't want to be that, you know, that person that was completely out in left field, <laughs> but yeah. it was, it was really nice to be sort of validated by a colleague that in somebody that's a specialist in that field that, Hey, what you did really did work. And the, the other part to it was I didn't want it to become good behavior was only done for bands. And I didn't want it yeah. to be, you know, the only reason that the kids were behaving or the kids were doing what they were doing was to get bands. I wanted them to, meet expectations because those are expectations and bands were given for exceeding those expectations. So that was also uh, one of those concerns and it's still tough. And I, I will, you know, caution anybody, any teacher that is going to start this program, you do have to find a nice balance between distribution, but also making sure that you're not over incentivizing and they don't become over reliant on on that token, on that reward necessarily. So you do have to walk a little bit of a fine line there. Yeah. One of the um, research papers I read or, or scanned, um, they said one of the cons, one of the dangers ex- is external motivators may be effective and well-intended, but clearly work against the children, uh, the continued development of a child's intrinsic motivation. Meaning like kids naturally want to learn and do well. And, could that, you know, could that potentially get in the way of that? Um, wh- so what are the results been? Have, I mean, have, have you noticed any kids doing, have, have you noticed kids thinking about the money versus empathy or the ethics or, you know, just naturally being good? I think, uh, I think a lot of it depends on sort of the, the demographic of the students, right? And I mean, I serve sort of a, a lower socioeconomic status school, so I a lot of them don't have those stronger intrinsic motivation skills because they were they just weren't developed. I mean, they just maybe they didn't have access to resources that would help develop those those skills at a young age, so they don't necessarily have the strongest intrinsic motivation. So having that extrinsic motivation, I find really does help to motivate them but then it's sort of one of those once they see they can be successful it starts to build that well just that even that feeling of being successful was really nice to have and now that's what they're going for more not necessarily that the band reward is there but that now it's the well i really liked how i felt when i worked hard for something and that we start to build that intrinsic motivation so eventually you want the bands to be yes they're there but what you're really going for is that feeling of I've accomplished my goal that I, I set out to do. Nice. Yeah. And for anybody listening who is unfamiliar, this has been a pilot program going on for uh, since 2008, I believe, in mainly inner city schools in the U.S. Um, they tested them out in Chicago and the... Um, lower socioeconomic areas in Chicago and also in D.C. and 
pretty much for the same reasons why you just mentioned is because they didn't have a lot of those things coming from family life and all the results have been pretty amazing in in lower income neighborhoods where they where they've introduced these um, cash for grades or whatever and some of them were you know testing stuff of like immediate gratification some of them were doing it what what I mean and you seem to have intrinsically done it I don't know if you if you studied ahead of time but you know giving immediate rewards and then long term rewards of opening up the shop or the market and so a lot of so some of the teachers here were doing it where they would when they were doing cash for grades they say okay you get you know whatever you get 250 now and then when you graduate you know we we give you the other half when you graduate and so it's you get the immediate reward and they can think long term and say oh you know i've been doing 5 years of this or whatever 3 years of this and it's built up and now i have this much um so it's it seems like you know ban aside just the idea of that kind of financial reward where they're using money to actually getting something to actually buy something with that they need or want seems to have pretty good um results for children so it's it, what re, i mean were you doing research beforehand or were you just kind of like at your wits end and kind of throwing spaghetti at the wall and hoping something would stick I, i'd love to sit here and tell you i did a lot of research <laughs> beforehand but it, it was definitely the you know throw whatever's gonna stick whatever's gonna work I, i'm willing to try you know anything at this point i'm tired of standing on my head for six and a half hours a day this i i need to be able to teach what can we do what were some of the best things that, you know, Oops and I had talked about were some of the best parts of our our education? What were some of the things that were lacking? And, you know, we came up with with this and the the idea that, you know, it's all virtual. Nothing can be stolen, lost, duplicated, anything like that. I think that comes down to the best part and that it's all, you know, traceable and trackable. And, you know, if I did teach as the kids get older or if it's integrated into an older classroom and kids have the independence, you can now start to teach some of these even cryptocurrency skills because it, it's, you know, whether, you know, you think it's here to stay or not, it is here to stay and cryptocurrency has become a reality of our world. So being able to teach kids now in a low risk, high reward type of type of environment with ban, I think it's a great tool as well moving forward with sort of the future of cryptocurrencies as a whole as well. Yeah, I, I don't I can't think of any system reward system using cash outside of direct cash stimulus like like payments. I can't think of anything right now that would allow somebody allow a teacher and a student to interact digitally with a payment system and still have it be protected without the student having to like open up an account or something. So it seems like the perfect situation for cryptocurrency because at the end of the day, you know, it's, you still have full control over everything, but they can have access to all these different things and you can create all these different wallets. And I, I mean, I can't do that in any of my bank apps or, or the cash app or Venmo or anything like that. So it's like, it just seems like a perfect situation for, for uh, teaching kids how to de- how to deal with money. No, it's it's honestly like the it is the perfect combination of that, right? And the fact that you can treat that closed ecosystem or the closed sort of the the closed economy within one Calium wallet that has all of these sub wallets for all of the students. And again, like I said, as if the students get older, you can then have them start to see like the go through the explorer and see as the transactions are posted they go oh yep i see that it's gone here oh i see you know mr g is making this many transactions in a day and that's a, a, just another shout out to the uh, the calium app because it is just an amazing app i probably make close to anywhere from 50 to 100 transactions in a day scanning the qr code oh really and then verifying with a fingerprint and it works just like that no problem you know, well, you figure 21 kids multiplied by roughly four, four to five transactions a day. We're looking at close to 100 transactions a day that go through the QR scanner and away we go. And it just works like that every time, which is great. So so what what's the thing that you that you give rewards for the most? Because if, you, if you're doing I, see in my mind, I was thinking like two or three a week to each student, but you're giving four or five a day. So what what are what are the things that they're getting rewarded for? Um, so we, we've definitely got like the, the cleanliness of the classroom. That's always the first morning reward that they get. So right off the bat, they're getting rewarded or we're having a conversation about where we need to be better. 
and what we need to do to be better to get more of those bands. So that's one right there. Um, typically, during our math block, after uh, after I see, you know, if they're working diligently, if they're working hard, I'll come around as they're working, as they have their QR code down on their desk, and it'll be, you know, 20 or 30 band here. Um, after, like, lunch hour and stuff, if I get a good report from the teacher that was in the lunchroom, you know, they were following the expectations. They were they were a nice group to be around, essentially. <laughs> they'll, they'll get bands at that point, you know, between 100 to 150. Um, walking to and from the gym, because we do have a very limited amount of time for physical education, which is really too bad. And that's, oh, that's a whole other can of worms that yeah. will open. <laughs> but, uh, but for walking, you know, to and from the gym quietly from participating well in phys ed and fairly so there's another you know almost 150 bands right there so throughout the day there's the opportunity for the students to earn really anywhere from i'd say low end maybe 150 to high end almost 500 bands so and again we incorporate sort of that bring back the math curriculum where we're working with those larger numbers into the almost hundred thousands place value. So then we're bringing it back to real world numbers as well for them. Nice. Nice. Are you the only teacher in the school doing this right now? So I, I'm the only one that has fully dived in. We do have another teacher in the school, Mr. S who has started who he's got his wallet set up. He's got the QR codes ready for the kids. The only problem is his kids are a little bit younger. They're, six to seven years old so it's just it's how do we adjust and what do we how do we work with that with that uh that age group and where their needs are and where they are cognitive development wise and that little bit more instant gratification so it along with the virtual token he's working on creating a physical token too that the kid can then have see hold but if it does get lost, there is still the virtual record of, okay, this is how many you do have, though. So we do know that part. So that's that's something that's in the works on that. And this is a program that would work, I would say, in typically, I would say, probably nine years old and up. This would be more ideal for than for the younger grades. But we are working on scaling it back to a a younger and eight and under sort of uh, ability to work with that age group as well. Gotcha. And then, so, like the, I mean, do you have like what? I forget what it is. I mean, in Canada, is it principals and vice principals just like here? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, what what's their reaction been? Um, quite honestly, it's uh, it's been a little lackluster. They're they're a little bit hands off on this aspect. So, it's it's a lot more of it's my it's kind of nice because it's my classroom and they're just kind of letting me do what I want to do. And really the, the, uh, the validation I guess would come from when I do have those sort of special assignment teachers come in and they see what goes on and then they'll ask follow-up questions because they want to take parts of this program and implement them into other classrooms. So I, I wouldn't say there's a whole lot of support from the, the administrative end, not because, you know, they're, they're against it, but because they don't really know what's going on. It's not, a high priority on their radar. There's a lot of other issues that go on within the school that I think is pulling their attention, especially towards the other end. There's a lot of behavior issues that now my classroom is no longer on the radar because we've <laughs> got it figured out with bands. So yeah. So if you were if you were going to pass along what you've learned to another to another teacher, same age students, what would be the first thing you would tell them not to do? Like, like, what have you, what did you learn? Like, what did you do in the beginning that you were like, oh, that didn't work or, or did it? Or, or was there anything like that? I would say, uh, make the store items non-consumables. That's, that's a big one because that again, stops you from having to go deep into your pocket. So if you can get things that maybe you have to buy one time or even better, if you don't have to buy it, it's just an, it's an activity the kids can do in class. So like another example, sort of a free one I have is paper airplane building you know you get the you get the ipad you get access to a few different paper airplane building videos and i give you a stack of paper and you can just you go to town on that so i think the biggest the biggest piece of advice i would give of what not to do is don't pick consumable things because then once you start with them too the kids begin to expect that yeah. and it's a lot harder to walk it back 
than it is to, you know, offer the odd consumable from time to time as a, a special item. Is, is there, I mean, that's, that's a great point. I never would have thought of that, but yeah, I guess as a teacher, that's probably the first thing they think of is like, I can't afford to have that every single week. Um, Absolutely. Is there something that you did that you saw an immediate negative effect on the, on the child and you could see like a, a, a negative visceral reaction to something you did with the ban? So the nice thing with ban is it's only ever used to say positive reward. So I never take ban from the kids. Once you've earned it, you've earned it because I, that positive, your negative behavior does not negate or cross out your positive behavior. So I don't think that we, it's really only ever a positive reinforcement tool. So I, I don't think I've ever really seen a, I mean, there's definitely been the letdown of, oh, well, we didn't get there. You guys didn't do it. And the the visual upset of like, you know, and especially when it is one or two classmates and it's a whole class thing, then you do, you do see that a little bit as well, that there is potentially some disdain or discontent between classmates. If especially there is a student who maybe is consistently the one. And there's the reason that we're not getting that the class as, it's whole, as a whole is not getting the bands because now that's drastically impacting the store opening and their enjoyment. And so there is the potential for that to happen as well. But if you do enough individual band rewards to the kids that aren't based on the class as a whole, you can negate that. So again, it's just finding that balance of whole class reward to individual reward as well. I mean, and have you had, have you seen obviously not severe, but like a moderate amount of um, shunning of certain kids who aren't pulling their weight and costing the group a reward. Like I, and, I like an, an ostracization, ostracization, I can't even say the word, ostracization. <laughs> I wouldn't say it, it would go that far, but you can definitely tell that kids will lose their patience with uh with certain students because there are repeat offenders we'll say of certain things so you know there's a student who every day no matter how many times you tell him to pick up the garbage after lunchtime at the end of the day always has garbage under his desk just it's as sure as the sun will rise they'll have garbage under their desk and so the kids just get frustrated right that you know and it it is kind of I don't want to say it's nice, but it is it's interesting for them then to sort of the shoes on the other foot, right? They're seeing it from almost my perspective now, right? Though yeah. it is really annoying that I have to tell that person, you know, fifteen times a day to pick up their garbage and they still don't do it. So then what you hope is they can reflect and translate that back onto how that impacts their own behavior. And it's like, well, do I do anything that like Mr. G has to remind me 15 times a day that, to do that like I shouldn't be doing? And so it's kind of cool that there's that reflective piece as well. But yeah, that's funny because I was probably that. I mean, God, I was the one that would always talk no matter what. They tell me to stop talking. And and that's why I have a podcast now. <laughs> I never stop talking. Um, and, and to go back to what you say, you, you never use it as a negative. Even with a bounty, you're not taking ban away from them. They're being forced to pay somebody a reward for finding their lost QR code. So that I mean, because that's that's a that's a big difference of you penalizing them financially versus them having to reward somebody else for their mistake. And that's a big psychological exactly. difference. That's uh, that's interesting that that you that you did the bounty that way. Um, well, nice. So what else, I mean, do you have, like, can you talk about the goals that you would like to try to implement that you think could you like take it to the next level or. Uh, yeah. So I, I do think that it, there would be, it would be nice to give at some point, some more autonomy to the students and like them having sort of control over the wall a little bit more. That again, like Oops and I have gone back and forth for hours on how this would work. And just we have some really big ideas for sort of creating whole macro economies within and even teaching about further financial literacy skills. So like things like investing and how interest works and how, you know, creating almost a a whole 
synthetic stock market around the bands and things like that to really, really hone in on those financial literacy skills. And again, you can see how it could be expanded from a young age and just extended upon as they get older to build these different blocks around it that we look at, you know, things like investing and things like that. So that's sort of the direction that we're looking is to use this as a really an all encompassing financial literacy teaching tool along with the classroom management piece. That's amazing. I mean, if that could, if you could figure out how to do that, that'd be, so if any devs are listening, talk to Mr. G, make that work. Um, the the Calium app, so if anybody doesn't know, Calium is the main Banano app. Um, and it's the app that the Natrium wallet for Nano was just pretty much copied, copy and pasted, you know, with a, a few small adjustments made here and there. And that and with Banano and Nano, since um, Banano is a clone, like, you know, kind of like a clone slash fork of Nano, a lot of them, you know, pass code back and forth. Um, what did, did oops or some, or a dev have to do something specific to the wallet that you use, or is it literally just the wallet that I can download and create 30 accounts for, or, or whatever. And, or was there something specific that they did for the classroom? So initially when we started two years ago with the program, no, I just downloaded the wallet the way we went. But once we moved to the individual wallet for each student then uh then we got some i can't remember who off the top of my head oops would be able to tell any of your listeners who that was but somebody was able to create um a program or a bot that created only school appropriate wallet seed so you oh, would get right, yeah a wallet seed that then would have all of the up to 30 wallets within it that were all sort of school appropriate school safe ones that you were going to be able to use and is that age was that based on age or grade level or? Uh, just sort of generic things that we figured were not necessarily the, well, great in the meme community, not necessarily the best <laughs> representations in a classroom, right? So yeah. uh, we looked at certain like content markers. So anything that, you know, promoted smoking, anything that promoted alcohol consumption, um, anything that had, any type of weaponry we tried to sort of stay away from. And again, not to say that the weapons would have necessarily caused a huge issue, but it's it's always better to err on the side of caution. Sure, especially with elementary school kids, you know. Absolutely, right? As, as you got older, maybe they would become less of an issue. I mean, obviously, you still wouldn't want to endorse any of the, the smoking or the, the drinking necessarily in a public school setting. Yeah, or the violence, but, you know, that's... Yeah. You know. Better safe than sorry, like you said. Um, is there would you, are there specific um, avatars that you would like to have created in the future, or like for that are like grade appropriate? Um, I think what would be what would be really cool is eventually to do a to do a collab with with Banana and with the devs there to create have students create their own avatars. And be able to have those sort of uploaded as well, and do their own their own sort of monkey artwork, and have some inspiration drawn from there as well. So that would be something that would be really cool to do down the road to uh, try to figure that out. Yeah, that'd be that'd be pretty cool. Um, what else? So, what else would you pass along to teachers if you had like five minutes? Be like, hey, this is this is what. I suggest, or this is why you should do it, or this is why you shouldn't do it, or, you know, what, like, what would you want to pass along to other, other teachers who are listening right now? Um, I think there's, there's a couple things. Number one is get yourself an oops, because he has done a phenomenal job on the back end of making sure everything is set up, everything is done, neatly organized in Google Drive, ready to go, and basically you can hit the ground running like that. So just definitely make sure you have you take the time to set up the back end of it and get that all organized. And really you just bring the energy with it. When you, when you introduce it to the students, if you're excited about it, they're going to be excited about it and make that first store really obtainable and make that like a really memorable day because they'll remember the, the feelings of that day every time they're earning them. And that will just help to build that, that motivation to work towards that goal. So 
that just just bring the energy be excited about it it is it's an amazing program and if you're a teacher doing it you are you're well ahead of your time so you should be excited because you're bringing something really cool to your students nice and last question how often are you are the kids getting access to the store once it's open once they so the store it. opens, uh, so it'll open for like the equivalent of like a block. So about a a fifty minute chunk of time, and it, it all depends. So they have to get a half of the half of the circulating supply. So just for example, if there was say a hundred thousand bands in the teacher's wallet, then the students would have to have fifty thousand of those between all of the student accounts added together. So it does sort of depend on on the students we typically every about i would say three weeks the store will open so it is a long time between bands being given and the reward but that's also because these students have had the program now for two years if you're starting out i would do it almost every friday or every other friday for the first little bit to make sure they know it's super obtainable yeah nice Nice, dude. Well, thanks for coming on. Was, I mean, this is really inspiring um, because a lot of people are uh, in 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 the mainstream media. Everyone's like, "Well, this is useless. It doesn't do anything. No one's doing anything with it. It's not real." And blah blah. And, and here's a perfect real world example of not only of it working, but working well and, and teaching children financial literacy and and just you know being and and group think and not group think, but like you know, group groups working together to achieve a goal together. I mean, these are all things that we try to teach people to be successful at in the real world. And school doesn't always do that. So it's an, it's impressive what you've been able to do and then to, and be able to accomplish. No, thank you. I appreciate that. And I, I do really appreciate you giving me the platform to come on here and sort of share about banana in the classroom. I know oops. And I have had many, uh, many a voice chat where we've ranted back and forth and it's great to finally be able to put it out there and sort of let other teachers know what's going on and know that there are these, these really cool programs and these really cool resources to bring and make financial literacy and classroom management and incentive programs into the 21st century and make it really come alive for the students. Well, it sounds like you're going to have to like get on a board of teachers who work with the Bano devs to start incorporating more of your ideas into like maybe a school side project, because it sounds like it'd be really nice to have a school specific type wallet to achieve a lot of the stuff that you want to do that may not necessarily be the wallet that everybody needs. Um, so it'd be interesting to see where it goes and if people you know, are able to contribute to that either financially to help pay devs to do it or something like that, or if you can get funds from school or get, some kind of grant to work on that. That'd be really interesting to see um, just what you can achieve. All right, dude. Well, I appreciate that. Thanks for coming on. Um, any last, any last things you want to get off your chest that you just, that I didn't ask you? Uh, no, honestly, again, I just want to sort of thank you for giving me access to your, your platform to share about banana in the classroom. It's really been sort of, oops and I's baby for the last like two, two and a half years now. And to really be able to put into words what this project has been, has been really awesome. So no, I just appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, of course. Of course. I'm excited to, to have people hear it. Um, and for anybody who doesn't know, I mentioned oops in the beginning. Oops is um, a community manager for Banano on the discord and he has access to all the devs more or less. And so when he says, when Mr. G said, you need to get yourself an oops, that's what he meant. Like you need to find somebody who has access to all that stuff. Probably most aren't. So that's why I think it'd be amazing to try to figure out a way for teachers to somehow connect with devs in the cryptocurrency space to to help make these things uh, more achievable for them. If they don't, ha if their best friend isn't <laughs> a <laughs> CM for Banana. <laughs> um, all right. Well, cool. Uh, how can people, if people have questions for you, what would be the best way of getting in touch with you? Uh, honestly, probably just via Discord. So let me just make sure I know what my Discord name is. <laughs> yeah, this was kind of hard. He just, he just told me to type in Mr. G. I was like, yeah, that's not working, dude. <laughs> Let's see. 
All right, so it is Mr. G, hashtag 5295. So if you have any, any teachers that want to reach out and collab on this project, we already do have some teachers as well that have reached out. And, you know, we're always looking for more people to bounce ideas off of on how we can improve banana in the classroom. And any skill set that anybody can offer, it's always great to have more people reaching out and helping to build this project. Yeah, that's great. And I'll make sure to have it in the show notes. So if anybody uh, is looking for it, it'll be there too. Well, thanks again for coming on. I can't wait to see, you know, we got to touch base like in a year or two after the, after um, COVID is over, hopefully fingers crossed and see how the transition went and see how maybe like your next set of students go. And I'd, you know, I really want to follow up and, and, and because this is really exciting to see, um, especially since you're kind of in a, in a, a lower socioeconomic school and you, and you said it's really benefiting for that. I'll be interested to see how it works long term. So, uh, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, and I'll talk to you next time.